Hello everyone. I want to bring you a different video. In the spirit of 4th of July, Independence Day, in the United States of America, I have the flag flying high, old glory, red, white, and blue. And uh, I want to bring you a video. This video is an interview with my father. He was uh, a U.S. Marine in Vietnam and served as a force recon Marine. He tells some interesting stories, some things I can't keep in the video because he gets pretty graphic, but um, I'm going to let you listen to his story. Here's the video. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. I guess you can't really call yourself a former recon Marine because you always are a recon Marine. Is that true? That's about right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Once Marine, always Marine. Right. Right. So uh, we're going to interview uh, my dad today. Hope you enjoy this interview and um, find some insight into his life and to the life of a military man. So state your name and your rank or your rank uh, when you were discharged. Oh, my name is Timothy Lamentain. My rank with my discharge was sergeant. I served with the Third Forces Consulates Company, Reconnaissance Company in Vietnam. And I trained with the Fifth Force Reconnaissance Company in Camp Pendleton, California. Okay. Okay. And um, what, I guess the first question is, what made you join? And you could always go back to your, uh, your youth and tell me what you were thinking at that time. Well, basically, you have to go back to the era of what was going on at the time. Mm. You got to remember that uh, most of our fathers, in my generation, the baby boomers, our fathers were in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. The Second World War started because they believed Chamberlain made a mistake of trying to appease Hitler. Mm -hmm. And it turned into one of the, the bloodiest war we ever had, plus the advent of the nuclear weapons at the end of the war mm. also changed the whole dynamics of warfare and what would happen if you did have another world war. Uh, we believed in fighting for our country, defending our country. We didn't want to make the same mistake that they made uh, in the Second World War, and that's let things get too far and grow too fast. So what they decided to do with the, uh, to defend themselves or defend ourselves against Russia was that brush fire wars is what they call them. So well, now hold on. So so you're in high school, right? Mm -hmm. you're hanging out with your friends, cruising the streets, having fun, and you decide to go into the military. What were you thinking at that time? What well, were your thoughts as a as a seventeen, eight year old kid? Well, you got to remember, when I was in my freshman year, we had the uh, uh, Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis. That was what, uh, 60? 1962. Two, okay. Right, JFK was, uh, was assassinated in 1963. Mm -hmm. They believed that the Soviets had something to do with that. Uh, you know, so it was an awful lot. Of, the Korean War had to have been fought in the 50s, up to, from 1950 to 1953. And it was a pretty, pretty bloody war against the Chinese and, the, and uh, Stalin. Stalin was the one that thought he mm -hmm. was betrayed by the United States when, uh, he, when uh, Truman put the, uh, the red line and he missed the 38th parallel. Now that's, He okay. thought he was being given to Korea. That it was uh, being handed okay. to him. Okay. And it wasn't. So different things happened that caused uh, a lot of conflict. A lot of mm -hmm. people died, uh, 40. 40,000 people died uh, in combat in uh, the Korean War. But, but you're in high school, and like, okay, so my, I guess my question is today. It just seems like today, many kids aren't thinking about going into the military, but it seemed like perhaps in your time you were. Was it something you felt like you had to do, something you were obligated to do, or you just wanted to do it because, because first of all, let me go back, you weren't drafted. No. Did you have any sense that your draft was coming? Did, did anyone know if their draft was if their draft card was going to be pulled? Uh, no, I wasn't worried about that. I had already made the determination I was going to join the Marine Corps. Okay, okay, that was the determination. But why made. did you make? But that? you got to remember that we all were subject to the draft. All males over the age of eighteen years old had to sign up for the draft, right? And they were subject to being drafted, usually around when you're nineteen years old. There are a couple of exemptions from it: going to college, having a family, kids. Was there that National uh, but, Guard exemption as well? And the National Guard. A okay. lot of people joined the National Guard to stay out of Vietnam. Right. The right. National Guard wasn't being sent to Vietnam because they had bad luck uh, experiences with it. If they were in combat and you lose a whole unit, a mm. company, 
all the bodies come back to the same location. Right. No, that makes sense. So makes it was, sense. they uh, dispersed the uh, casualties all over the country. They're not <laughs> any one town would see uh, 100 casualties coming in at once. Well, I mean, I guess that's see a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's a good idea. Okay. So, so again, you made the decision to go. You made the decision to go when? Freshman, sophomore? Like, when? Was it ingrained in you from... I made, the, I made the decision to go after reading an article in Look Magazine. Look Magazine? Look Magazine. Okay. And Staff, Staff Sergeant Hamlin. Uh, he was a reconnaissance Marine, first reconnaissance Marine. He had lost his leg in a parachute jump. And uh, jump zone is a door in Camp Pendleton. Mm-hmm. He, uh, the boots he was wearing had uh, nails that holding the heels on. And his foot hit a power line. Okay. And it burnt the bone marrow. It burnt the bone marrow on his leg, and he lost his leg. Okay. He wanted to stay in the Marine Corps, so he had to go through a rigorous PT test to prove that he was still capable of, uh, uh, you know, uh, carrying out his duties as, you know, in the Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was what got me to join Force Recon. <laughs> That's what gave me the idea that I was going to go to Force All Recon. All right, before you even get to Force Recon, you have to first go to... Uh, recruitment station or what have you and, and go and sign up to be a Marine. Now, do you Correct. just sign up to be a Marine? Just signed up to be a Marine, yes. Okay, but I okay, so just, once you're not a Marine, are you a Marine when you sign that paper or are you a Marine in training? Like, what's, what's the legitimate thing? You become a Marine once you take the oath when you're down at Paris Island and you uh, take the oath to defend your country. Okay. And, uh, and you really don't become a Marine until you finish boot camp. Okay. That's what, according to the Marines. It's like you once you're in boot camp, you're a recruit, and you're a Marine once you finish boot camp. You said that you already decided that you're going to be in the, who Who put that in your head, or why was that thought in your head? Or was it just what males typically did in the, you know, 60s? Well, it was an option for kids going to, to high school rather than going to college and going to, going to service. Mm-hmm. I had originally thought that I was going to make a career out of it. But I changed my mind after Vietnam. Okay, we'll right. get there. Don't go we'll too deep in that. There's reasons for that. Okay, There's reasons for that. Okay, okay. But uh, so it, it was. But a, it was it, something it was a, every 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 uh, young man in those days knew that he was obligated to serve his country, and it was a duty to serve your country. People felt that it was your duty that your, you know, mm-hmm. your uh, parents had done it, your grandparents had done it, but at the same time, before them had done it, and you were expected to do. The same thing they did. Like the people at the Alamo, they stood and they fought, they didn't run. You know, they did it and they were expected to do the same thing. Yeah. It's like a story that I know about the Alamo. When I saw the place was made out of adobe, I realized that I wasn't going to stand in an adobe fort and <laughs> okay. with cannon fire. So, gotcha. Which gotcha. saved my life in Vietnam. <laughs> gotcha. I knew what cover and concealment was. Right, right. So, so okay. So, that's just what you did. It's just what you were thinking at the time. It's just what we, a lot of people did it. Okay. I wasn't doing it when a lot of people joined. The right. Marine Corps was mostly volunteer. <clears throat> volunteer. The Air Force was volunteer. Right, right. The Navy was mostly volunteer. Right. So, you also had people volunteering to go in the Army. They take the uh, uh, two year, sign up for the draft early or take the, you know, the two years. There was a two year uh, enlistment in the Marine Corps at the time. So, rather than get drafted, people joined the two year enlistment in the Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, different options. People that took the two-year enlistment still were sent right off to Vietnam mm-hmm. after boot camp. So did you know, did you know at the time that you were going to go to Vietnam? Like, if you went into the Marines, you knew you were going. I knew I was going, yeah. Were there Marines that didn't go? I mean, obviously there, there are. are but... There's a lot of people that didn't go. There okay. are people that served in Korea. There's as friends that served in Korea, as friends that served in Thailand, mm-hmm. Germany. Uh, mm-hmm. Not in the Marine Corps mostly, but to Germany, but Army, served mm-hmm. in Germany, Air Force. My brother served in uh, Greece. He served in France. He served in Spain. And he, wasn't gonna, he wouldn't have gone to Vietnam except he volunteered for Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had completed his overseas uh, commitment. Mm-hmm. And he volunteered. He went over to Vietnam as a school teacher. So, so would you, do you know if, if at the time it was majority, um, I, I mean, the, the armed forces in general, was it majority draft or majority um, volunteer? Three quarters of the people in the military at the time were volunteers. Three okay. quarters of the people in Vietnam were volunteers. Not volunteering to go to Vietnam, but volunteering to go into service. Okay. Okay. 
Well, it's just a, you know somewhat of a different story than what I thought. I had no idea. I thought, you know, growing up, going through school, that everyone was uh, drafted and in some way forced there. But we don't have to go there. It's just what my perception was at the time. I didn't really know. So when I heard that, you know, when you told uh, my brother and I that we, you know, that you volunteered, it was just, uh, I didn't know. I thought you were probably one in a million that volunteered. You know? That was one of many. Okay. One of many. Okay. You got to remember, the American people were very patriotic. Yeah. They believed in the country. They knew what we had in comparison to what other people had. Mm -hmm. And they were willing to fight and die for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, They've seen what was going on in the world. They had, uh, most of them lived through the Depression. They've seen the, uh, a lot of them seen the First World War. Didn't go, but they lived through, through it. Mm -hmm. uh, they know the... Uh, Sacrifices people made to keep the country to keep, maintain it as a free country, as a free, right. uh, republic, and uh, you know, and when it came your turn to go, you're expected to go, mm -hmm. do your duty, do your you know, fulfill your obligation. Mm -hmm. I think another video we'll, we'll have to do. We talk about the difference between now and then, but we'll leave that for later because I want to more. I want to focus more on on you, obviously, in your history. So. You get to, you get to boot camp. Now, when you go to boot camp, you're not a recon marine. No. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, you go to boot camp, and I didn't take a long bus ride. I took the train down to Paris Island with the other recruits, mm -hmm. and then you get down to Isle of June. You get on a bus, and they take you into the, to the base. Okay. Right? And the first thing, oh, not with June, it's Paris Island, I'm sorry, Paris Island. That's right. And uh, uh, you go down to Paris Island, you get uh, get bussed in, Buford, from Buford to Paris Island. And they take you, you get on the base, and you remember the last thing you said, oh, it can't be as bad as they say it is. And all of a sudden, you get into a world of shit. <laughs> <laughs> you find out that these people are maniacs. They come in, they, right. they step you off the bus. They uh, <laughs> From the moment you're off the bus, the moment they're screaming you're off at the you? Bus, they're screaming at you. They're <laughs> giving you a hard time. Right, right. They had the orange, the yellow footprints. All of a sudden, a crazy man comes running up on the bus and starts telling everybody, get off the bus, get off the bus, hurry up. Get on the yellow footprints. Get your feet on the yellow footprints. Okay, now hold on. What are the yellow footprints? The yellow footprints are these in the cement. And they on the Okay. Top, they had yellow footprints for everybody to for everybody to stand on. So you knew exactly how to stand, where to stand, correct spacing okay. between you and your fellow Marines or recruits. Okay. Get your uniform, your clothing, uh take all your civilian clothes away from you and uh, send them back home to your house. We weren't allowed to keep anything. Okay. Civilian, civilian, attire, civilian attire. Okay. All right, you get all your clothes, and then they take you over, and they're going to they're gonna treat you to a nice meal at the mess hall. And okay. the nice meal I had was uh, two che uh, grilled cheese sandwiches, a carton of milk, and an apple. Sounds like right. a delicacy, right? Then I ate it all. <laughs> I ate my <laughs> but one, we had one recruit that didn't eat his okay. cheese, uh, grilled cheese sandwiches. And his apple and drink his milk. So it's grilled cheese, not cheeseburger. No, grilled cheese. Grilled, grilled cheese. cheese. My fault. Okay. And so the, uh, the grill instructor came up to him, grabbed the grilled cheese sandwiches, told him to open his mouth, and shoved the grilled, grilled cheese sandwich down his throat. Okay. Then he told oh. him, <laughs> then he told him, open his mouth again, grabbed the, grabbed the milk, and poured that in on top of that, and then stuck the apple in his mouth and told him to chew. <laughs> and he tried I don't know if that's what they do now. <laughs> that's right. a story he had. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so so it's hell. That basically sounds like your first night. Is well, hell. you didn't. Yeah, you didn't get to sleep for twenty four hours, forty eight hours almost. And, and <laughs> what the heck? This is boot camp. This is what happened. <laughs> okay, so you're saying that you get there and for forty eight hours you can't. You have to eat. You can't go to the bathroom. And you, you can't, can't use the facilities. You no. can't use the facilities. No. <laughs> you wonder what it's like. <laughs> <clears throat> it's not fun. Huh? So what you're saying is boot camp is <laughs> what you're saying is boot camp is not fun. Not a, no. Okay. Is, is it what you expected? Did anyone prepare you for boot camp? Well, you heard a lot of stories about it, but you just didn't. You said oh, it can't be that bad. Or, you, know, uh -huh. you could never really imagine how bad it really was until you got there. Okay. And then you got the Paris Island, and it's like, oh, and we're. I was also during the time when they had the. 
McNamara's 100, where they had Please people who couldn't that pass the IQ test. Okay. They were in a board, like uh, Forrest Gump would, would have been one of McNamara's 100. And we had a guy that was there that was completely incompetent, couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And he was on Paris Island when I got there for six months. Okay. <laughs> couldn't do anything. And he was, he was going around. I mean, All he was right. so bad. He was going okay. around. Taking his <laughs> so at this point in the interview, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand what this is like. Uh, someone who did not serve, did not... Um, go to Paris Island, I, I really had to look at this and find out what was going on. So I'm going to bring this up, all right? And I'm just going to play this quickly and see if this makes, uh, makes you understand it a bit better, okay? I'm going to play a part of this video. It is a, uh, it's called the USMC Yellow Footprints, receiving phase of the Marine Corps boot camp on Paris Island. To earn the title of United States Marine. It starts when a drill instructor steps onto the bus to welcome them to Paris Island. Back your hands up and look at me right now. Scream, I sir. No, scream louder than that. But from this point forward, every time I open my face, you will respond back. Do you understand? Scream louder. Now, when I tell you to, you're going to get all your crap. Get up and get on my bus. Get on my yellow footprints. Four and through side by side. Do you understand? That's not screaming! I sir! I sir! Get up! I sir! Okay, sit down! I sir! Scream louder than that! I sir! Get up! I sir! Get off my bus! I sir! They soon realize that their lives are about to change <laughs> forever. Every enlisted member of the world's finest fighting force begins their transformation on the same iconic yellow footprints. Not everyone standing here will earn the title of U.S. Marine. The Marine Corps' success depends on teamwork. Therefore, teamwork is an essential part of your training here at Paris Island. From now on, you will train as a team. You will eat, live, sleep, and train as a team. The word I is no longer part of your vocabulary. Do we understand? Yes, sir! To do so, they must pass through the most demanding recruit training in the world. Now you see what... Now you see what my father was talking about. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is what he's talking about what, by McNamara's uh, 100. Look into that. So this next part that my dad started talking about was uh, Defense Secretary, is it Re Defense Secretary Robert McNamara? He, uh, he had some ideas. And so here's one of them. I'll bring this up. I'll read it for you as well. It says, McNamara line. In 1967, McNamara proposed creating a barrier across the demilitarized zone, the DMZ, between North and South Vietnam. Instead of creating an actual wall, which would be too costly in both materials and manpower, the barrier, were, the barrier would have two components, high-tech listening devices and vibration detectors, and a complement of more traditional military weapons like landmines and barbed wire. The line designed to deter the PAVN army from crossing the DMZ, also served as a warning system to the Americans, who could then direct artillery shells and missiles to the enemy crossing the line. The program met with many problems, and after the siege of Quezon in 1968, the military commanders determined that the manpower necessary to lay the sensors and landmines were better used elsewhere. So this is where this gentleman who put this video together is talking about uh, Robert McNamara's um, Project 100,000, sometimes called the Moron Corps, was initiated in October 1966 and was sold as part of Johnson's War on Poverty. It was, that would be President Lyndon Baines Johnson. It was claimed at the time to give training and opportunity to the poor and uneducated. It was initiated to meet the escalating needs for additional manpower in Vietnam War. So, these men were classified as new standards men. To make them more visible, they were given special service numbers so that future commanders would know who they were. I'm going to play this a bit. When the gimmicks weren't working, maybe we start putting more boots on the ground, which creates a problem. Where do you get these boots? So, McNamara came up with Project 100,000. 
sometimes called the Moron Corps, and was initiated in October of 1966 by Defense Secretary Robert Strange McNamara. So we'll keep on with this, let you know what this was about. The new standards men had scored. These are people who had already been tried to be inducted in the military, but failed the IQ test or, or other different tests and so forth. These men had scored in, uh, in the fourth category of the Armed Forces Qualification Test that placed them in the top to 30th percentile range. The new standard uh, uh, standards men recruited in somewhere in the 320 to 354,000. So you can see that this already sounds like a bad idea. It really does. Uh, not only that, it's, it's exploitive. And so this is what my dad was referring to. And you can le read the last sentence. McNamara's 100,000 soldiers included those unable to speak English, low aptitude, physical impairments, along with those too tall, too short, overweight, or underweight. So, you know, I don't know about the whole too tall and too short thing, but you could see that this was uh, exploitative and also uh, probably a bad idea. That's what my dad was referring to. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, uh, okay, I'm that fine. All right, fine. I laugh about it now. But well, I'm glad you laugh about it now. That's good you laugh about it now. Okay, but all right, so... Uh, so... Um, you get through boot camp, right? It wasn't that easy to get through. You, you get go, through yeah, it. Yeah, do some training, too. Of course. You're you it, train, you know. you're there, you get through it. Right. I'm not trying to cheapen it, but I'm, I'm kind of lost on the underwear thing right now that you were telling me. Well, I mean, the first shower you get, they, they go in, they turn all the water on their shower. You run in, run through all the water. You come out, you go to the, uh, if you got to go pee or something, you go pee. While you're running? You got to keep moving, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay. okay. <laughs> you know, you have to shave. You can stop to shave, and you, you know, and then you move out, and you get, uh, you know, you get dressed, and you get ready to, for the morning to get started again. Mm -hmm. And you go to go to the mess hall, you get something to eat, but you got to, you know, the, the rule was, you know, take what you want, but eat what you take. Of course. So you couldn't leave anything. It was something it was after the night before, and we're seeing someone get their uh, meal fed to them. <laughs> right. That maybe, maybe you ought to eat everything. They're probably serious right. about that. Right. Okay. Uh, then you go out and you start your training program. Most of it was uh, drill, how, learning how to march, learning how to uh, stand at attention, learning how to salute, learning how to uh, stand at parade, rest at ease. Wait, and are you happy with your decision at this point? At this point? Yes. When I'm at boot camp. Yes. And I'm still happy. I figured the good stuff was going to come up. That is just <laughs> okay. You, you're 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 learning how to march, how to right, and pray, you know, drill and stuff like sure, that, sure, sure. just to get you, you know, how to keep your space and all all that. And then uh, you start learning something about the weapons. You start getting uh, go to the uh, the rifle range. What weapon are you trained on first? I was trained on the M14. Okay. And uh, the M14 uh, was a weapon that had semi-automatic, the 7.62 NATO round is what it fired. And it uh, uh, had fully automatic capabilities, except when you put it on automatic, the thing would just go up like that. Right, right, know. right, right. And when you're firing automatic anyway, you shoot three to four round burst. You don't yeah. uh, you yeah. just put it on and just spray the area. And go. Oh, you don't, you don't shoot from the hip? Like this. You do hip? No, you don't. You, you, you know. Oh, hold it above like the movies. You don't do no, that. Sometimes, sometimes if you're in real combat, you might hold it above. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Hoping right. you hit somebody. <laughs> Hoping you hit somebody. Yeah. Um, okay. But uh, you know, you learn how to throw a grenade. You learn how to. We had uh, bazookas in those days, rocket launchers. Mm -hmm. That was fun. You shoot the bazooka. You shoot the uh, oh, the M60 machine gun, a 50 caliber machine gun. You get to see some of the demolitions that they have, uh, mm -hmm. how to work. Mm -hmm. And you uh, basically it's learning how to, uh, you know, you see you're cleaning your weapon, disassembling your weapon, assembling your weapon, doing it blindfolded and all that. Right, you know, right. You know, get used to, uh, you know, when we, matter of fact, when we PT, we PT with the weapon. You know, the rifle, you use that as your weight, you know. Pick it up over your head, put it sure, up, bring it sure. down, put it out, that sort of thing. So it's basically getting familiar with your weapon, getting used to handling a weapon, mm -hmm. learn how to use a gunfire 45, 
Did yeah. you carry a forty-five, or did only certain people have a forty a sidearm? I could have carried. I could have carried a forty-five if I wanted to. If you're in combat, a, a pistol isn't much. Wait, they had they had flak jackets, what they called, but they weren't. They were good for shrapnel or something like that. But bullets, they weren't all that good. They, that's true. Most we people didn't have... warm and left the front open. Right. It was hot there. You didn't. Uh, you know. Uh, you had to, uh, they had helmets. You know, steel pot. Uh, in reconnaissance, I wore a soft cap into the woods because it didn't make any noise. I didn't wear a flak jacket. So how do you get into Force Recon? All right. The first thing you do is I went to ITR, infantry, after boot camp, I went to ITR. What's ITR? Infantry training. Regiment. Okay. Okay. Uh, I was going to, uh, the MOS that they had given me was a 2533 radio telegraph operator. Okay. All right. Which was lucky for me because I wanted to get into Force Recon. There were two MOSs you could have that were basically Force Recon MOSs. 0311, which is an infantry man, or 2533, which is a radio man. They, they I had to go to San Diego to radio telegraph school. Okay. Who uh, made you that? It was, was a that six been... months. That's the MOS I was assigned. Okay. You take uh, your, your uh, test of your application, you know, what you're uh, capable of doing. Or, uh, you have to do tests. Mm -hmm. And mine turned out that I'd make a good 2533 radio telegraph operator. That'd be with the Morse code and using the uh, the key to tap out the, uh, the Morse code. Okay. Uh, we, it was a, a radio that they used the force radio operator to use the force recon because it was you could do long range reconnaissance patrols with the uh, CW radios, mm -hmm. with the, uh, and you had the keyboard you tied it, hooked it on your leg and you could tap it out. Okay. You know, it's you know, it's just slid on your leg, a little wire, like metal uh, wire thing that uh, they just tap for Morse code. Well, the Morse code was a key. Uh, you know. and uh, the radios were heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, can't remember the name. I think uh, PRC forty-seven, PRC uh, forty-six, which were the uh, long-range Morse code radios, and we had the PRC twenty. Uh, 25s, which, mm -hmm. uh, were voice, all voice, so go to it. Uh, when I got out of radio school, they came to the radio school and asked for volunteers for Forest Recon. Okay. Which worked right into my plan. There was a lot of luck that went into this. It, it did it. One, my own MOS. Once I wasn't going to be an infantry, I wanted to be an infantry man. Once I wasn't going to be an infantry man, I found out the 2533 radio operator, which I've got assigned to, mm -hmm. would, would, was used in Forest Recon. So we came uh, down from Fort, uh, Camp Pendleton down to San Diego, mm -hmm. and they asked us to uh, volunteer for Force Recon. And we took us up to they took us up to Pendleton and put us through the uh, PT test, which is different than the, didn't you have a PT test for just basic boot camp? This was harder. This was harder. Okay. Of, uh, you know, to get you up and uh, we were. It was in the summertime. It was uh, I graduated from radio school in June. And we were taken up there. It was hot in California at that time, going mm. up through the mountains. What year was this? Uh, 1967. Okay. Yeah, I went in, in 19, the summer, July of 1966. Now, we're already in war, or we're in a conflict. The, the, we're in a conflict. The yeah, conflict's we, going on. Yeah. Okay. And uh, they needed two radio, they needed two people to, for a first recon. Mm -hmm. And they uh, had six people tried out. I was one of the two that happened to make it through the whole PT test. Oh, okay. So it's, you know, mm -hmm. and, and when you get done, it was like people were just dropping, you know, down, just passing out, and, you know, the other four people didn't, didn't make it. And, uh, right. and another guy, he had been in Vietnam. He came back. He wanted to go to Fort Recon after coming back from Vietnam. And I, uh, I got into Fort Recon before I went. Mm -hmm. Then we got sent, uh, you know, we're assigned to the Fifth Force of Conscious Company, and we went through more training there. Mm -hmm. A lot of PT, a lot of running, and that's what it. Uh, the PT test for Force Recon was, uh, you know, push-ups, pull-ups, climbing a rope, do uh, step-ups, the uh, whole PT range. But the main thing was the running, and mm -hmm. they ran us up a mountain. These mountains weren't like the. Uh, the Rockies, but they're a lot higher than the mountains I was used to here in Connecticut. Sure, yeah. and they're a lot hotter. Right, you know, right. No, no shade, no trees. It was just you know open. 
mm -hmm. and uh, we ran up across the ridge line, back down, and then we had to run to, uh, across an open field to uh, the barracks. So now, how were you feeling on this? So, so let's go back quickly to high school. You were in shape leaving yeah. high school, pretty much, right? Mm -hmm. What did you do in high school to prepare yourself, or, or at least maybe nothing prepares you, but what did you do in high school to be physically fit? Well, a lot of calisthenics, a lot of push-ups, pull-ups, sports, uh, sit-ups, uh, sports. I played soccer, I played basketball. Soccer? Uh, you're always running in soccer. Always running, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did a lot of running on my own. A lot of, you know, we used to run on the had railroad tracks behind my house, and we used to run on them. We used to do sprints, and we used to, do, you know, jobs. And this is just for fun. This is just what you fun. did for yeah. fun. You yeah. didn't play with video games, not that there were any, but you just, it's what you did for fun. That's what we did for fun. Okay. Yeah, and played basketball down at the park. Mm -hmm. uh, football on Sunday afternoons. We had the Sunday afternoon. So a lot of athletics, a lot of, a lot of sports. Would um, you say that was normal for your, your for boys at that time? It was pretty normal for boys at the time, yeah. It's sports, How about girls? No, girls didn't do that much in sports. They, at that uh, time, yeah, at that in time, the 60s. Yeah. They uh, were prim and proper and all that. You know, it's like yeah. they didn't want to develop muscles. It was in those days, they, you know, uh, they frowned on having a muscular body. Huh. Uh, yeah. So you, you so okay so you would you say that a lot of men were prepared for this? You said a lot of people dropped out, so maybe they weren't prepared. Well, this was a special thing. They wanted the best. Okay. So if you had the standard here, they raised the standard to here. So would you say that was regular the boot camp is here, and then recon is here? Yeah. Okay. I mean, just getting through. If they all got through boot camp, they're in good shape. Right. By the time, if you weren't when you get went in, you were when you got out. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, I've seen a lot of people drop a lot of weight in boot camp. Mm hmm. Did a lot of people come in loose? You know what I mean? Like when you saw people in regular in boot camp, not recon boot camp. Did you see men come in that weren't in shape? There were a couple that weren't in shape that uh, you know needed some work. A okay. lot of them, you know, they kept them if they didn't make it through the PT uh, test, then they had to go back through boot camp again. Okay. They got into uh, into the conditioning to be able to get through. Okay. To meet the standards that they wanted you to meet. Sure, sure. But by the time you got out, it was about everybody met with the standards. It was of course. a rigorous I mean, training program. Unless you don't make it. I mean, if yeah. you made it through, you're probably in tip-top shape at that point. Right. Uh, well, my friend said I was in better shape when I, before I went to the Marine Corps than I was after I got out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, you get through everything, and... Um, and then you end up going to where? Vietnam? You get uh, well, assigned I to? to? I, got, I got into the Fifth Force Scouts Company. I trained there for seven months. Okay. Uh, I was volunteering for Vietnam every chance I got. Okay. Trying to get there. And they uh, they just told me the assignments weren't right or this wasn't right or going, not, going to Westpac, but not to Vietnam, mm -hmm. Okinawa or someplace. You know, okay. so, uh, finally, they came up with a uh, draft for Vietnam. And I signed up, you know, I told them I wanted, they gave it to me, sent me home on leave. And when I came back, there was a wedding. One of my friends was getting married, he, and uh, I was supposed to be the best man to the wedding. And when I got back to Camp Pendleton, everybody was gone. Hmm. They had sent them all to Vietnam. Okay. About the, you know, the, just about the whole company got sent to Vietnam. The head of 68 had broken. So now we're, so you weren't, in what they call in country, you weren't in Vietnam during the Tet of '68. You were still in California. I was still I was in California. The Tet Offensive was, I believe, January twenty second, nineteen sixty eight. Okay. And when that broke out, I was home on leave when that broke out. When I got back, I had to go to uh, uh, two weeks of uh, uh, training uh, before the sense of Vietnam. They had two weeks of training. And uh, I did that, and I got sent to Vietnam after in March 10th. I got there by March 10th, 1960. The uh, Tet Offensive was, was over. That was, uh, it wasn't quite over. There was still quite a bit of combat going on. Quezon was still under siege. And we'll get to Quezon. Uh, we'll get the, to Quezon uh, soon. I was sent to Northern I Corps, uh, the Third Force of Counselors Company, which was up in Dang uh, Ha. Well, yeah, wait, well, but, well, so before you, so you get, you go through two weeks of training, you come back from leave, you go 
two weeks of training, and then you get sent to Vietnam. That's right. And you're assigned to some location. What location was your first location? You... Dang Ha. Dang Ha. With the Third Force Reconnaissance Company. That was, that was where our base was. We were... So you weren't Third Force Reconnaissance. You were just a recon Marine waiting to go to be assigned. You were assigned to the Third Force Recon. That's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. And, uh, well, again, I had to volunteer for recon. Once I got sent to Vietnam, I had to volunteer for recon. Okay. It was totally volunteer. They wanted to every, make sure that even when you're in Vietnam, you had to volunteer. So no one, well, is it true to say that no one was drafted if they were recon? Or they might have been drafted initially, but once you get there. The, the only people I had uh, that were close to being drafted were the guys that signed up for two years. Okay. And they had to take a quick reconnaissance course in the States. And they got sent to Vietnam, and they joined up with. So, who was mainly drafted? The Army, Infantry, Army, Infantry, was mainly the Americal Division and stuff like right. that. And you wouldn't, you, you don't. I mean, you only know what you know through reading and history, but that that's not part of your experience. That's so not part of my experience. Most of the Marines were volunteers. Okay, okay. Uh, so you get to Dung Ha. Mm -hmm. All right, what happens? You walk in. Hey, I'm here. You have your bag. You're ready to go. Well, I got the. <laughs> What happens? I got to Dong Ha, and I, went, I showed up at uh, Third Force Reconnaissance Company. Okay. You know, you just make your own way. I, I, but I, when you know, walk in, I are found you a like flight. I found, I, I, we got sent to Da Nang. So I first flew into Da Nang from Okinawa. Yeah. Uh, when I got to Da Nang, I found a flight that was going to take me up to, I volunteered for recon. They told me that uh, there's an airport over there. Go sit in there and get a flight up to uh, Dong Ha. Okay. So I took, a, I found a flight, a C-130, that took me up to Dang Ha, mm -hmm. and I got it off, and then I looked around, and I said, I, I got to get the Third Force Reconnaissance Company now. Well, so, okay, well, you land, where, where are you? In Vietnam. But Dang where? Ha, like at you, the airport. Okay, airfield. And, and is there, airfield. Okay. Is there, a, is there a, a military contingent or something, or is there anyone pointing you in the right direction? Looks like an old bus station with a guy behind the counter. So there. you... Metal, I don't metal, understand. Metal, metal wooden benches and stuff. So like that there. you fly in. Yeah, you, you're in Da Nang. Mm -hmm. So you go from Okinawa to Da Nang. Correct. And then you, they're like, go to the airport and go to Dang Ha. Correct. So you get to Dang. So you just how, you book a flight. Well, you just wait for the next flight going out where they got room. Then C-130, okay. they just let you. You got. You went in. You sat down. Okay, I'm like, sorry. I'm sorry. So C-130. So there is a military plane there, and they're like. Go. That's your plane. That's Get your on plane. that plane. That's right. Oh, okay. I'm and sorry. you go in, you sit down on, on the floor of the plane. Yeah, of course. And they put a, a strap yeah. across everybody. Like yeah. the, the whole so lot. there's a bunch of people there with you. Yeah. Okay. There's got like, there were like 30 people or more, you know, okay. maybe 50. But, uh, you yeah, know, we all got, and then you go up and you go and you dive into Dang Ha. Gunfire or no gunfire? There was no gunfire. So you just, right. you get in. The mortars came in after the plane landed. <laughs> they, they're waiting for you to land. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Uh, <laughs> Good thing they missed. <laughs> so then I had to get up to where the for, uh, Third Force Council Company So was. who tells you which way to go? Well, I found a guy, he's a lieutenant, and he had his radio man, and he had a Jeep, and I asked him for a ride. I said, you guys get me to, you know, where the Third Force Council Company is? So he said, oh, yeah, we know where it is. We're the, okay. In short party, we're right next to it. So you find this guy, the lieutenant with a Jeep, and his radio man. Yeah. And they bring you to? To, to Third Force Council's company. Okay, that's good. At least so I know, I know, you know, the routine. You have to have your paperwork and you go in and you see the first sergeant. Or, uh, and you go in as what? what? What's your rank when you walk in there? My rank was Lance Corporal. Lance Corporal, okay. So, uh, yeah, I give him my paperwork and tell him I'm here. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple other guys standing around there and stuff. He said, all right, you guys got to get on that, that Jeep over there. Get in that Jeep. and we Old school Jeep? Old school Jeep, yeah. Like old World police. War II, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so what's John down. Wayne with crutches being dragged through the space type of Jeep? Yeah. <laughs> like the longest, was it the longest day? <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> so they take us down to Quang Tree, and they have that to, we, I was with Force Recon, mm -hmm. and there's another group called Battalion Recon. That's where they had so the train. So you get on the Jeep. You get on they the take Jeep. us to Quang Tree. Quang, Quang Tree. Quang Tree. Okay. Combat base. Okay. Not the city, the combat base. All right. All right. So when we get down to Quang Tree, we get in a training group for two weeks. We're supposed to be trained for recon again. They, you know, more training. This is how it is if you had to get acclimatized to the weather and everything else. Uh, while I'm down at Quang Tree, we had the Quang Tree Defensive. Okay. 
and a grunt company got wiped out. What's a grunt uh, company? An infantry company. Okay. You got the line companies. They come in line. Uh, you know, they formed the line, and was, uh, they were preparing for an assault for the North Vietnamese Army. And uh, when they got wiped out, they just grabbed anybody that they could find okay. that had infantry exposure, which of course were John, you, you do. So they grabbed us and threw us out in the line to take the place of that company. Hmm. And uh, yeah, we spent. Actually, we only spent a night out there, but it was the night that the attack came. Wow. And uh, hmm. what they did is they, we thought they were going to take over. We were put in, in the way of them getting to the base. Right. We thought they were going after our base, but they weren't. They were going after the town of Quang Tree. So they went by us in the middle of the night. A lot of artillery, so a lot of flares. You're in we, South Vietnam. Okay. Yeah, South Vietnam was where all the fighting happened. Well, that's They true. were bombing yeah. North Vietnam with the B-52s, but they, we weren't. We weren't in North Vietnam. Okay. So for the most part, all the fighting is more, is it more of a defensive posture in South Vietnam? Because you're clearly not on the offensive if you're fighting well, in after, your own territory. After, after the, uh, the Tet Offensive, it was mostly offense. So you, okay. Before the Tet Offensive, there was a lot of, uh, I mean, a lot of defense. After uh, the Tet Offensive, there was a lot of defense. Because we're protecting the towns. And see, our job was to protect the towns of Northern I Corps. Vietnam. We had Kua Viet, uh, Dong Ha, Quang Tri, uh, Cam Lo, and we had bases throughout the area. We had the Dong Ha base, we had the Kua Viet base, we had the Quang Tri base, we also had a place called the Rock Pile, which was Camp Carroll, Khan Tien, which was up on the DMZ, and Khe San, which was out in the uh, western part of Vietnam, which was called the Cork, supposed to stop the people from coming in from the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So when you were in Dong Ha, you're really there protecting the town. Is Correct. That, okay. Yes. And because the, the, the North Vietnamese, you were saying the North Vietnamese would attack the towns, not um, the American soldiers. It was right. mainly to attack the town. Why? Well, they wanted to put fear into, into the uh, people. Right. And they were attacking the arm, armed forces were uh, stationed in and protecting the towns. We were staying on combat bases away from the town. We took part in the operations and uh, as a defense of Quang Tri, I was uh, uh, replaced with a group of, of uh, Force Reconnaissance Marines that replaced a company of uh, grunts, uh, infantrymen that were wiped out, Marine Corps infantrymen that were wiped out in the fighting. By protecting the town? They were protecting the town. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we went out and we had a whole, we were positioned to stop their advance going toward the Dong Ha combat base, which is the direction we thought they were going to take. Okay. But at night, it turned out that the North Vietnamese had no intention of taking over, uh, going into our base. They went into the town of Dong Ha and headed in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we could see they were out there with the artillery and bombings and gunships, you know, fighting flares going off. We could see what was going on. Mm -hmm. But we really didn't get into real combat at that time. It was, they avoided us and they went in and they went toward the Arvins. And they, well, they, they were, were stopped at night. Which they, would stop from getting into Dong Ha. Right, and they would... So they would go after the town's people. That's correct. Yeah, and what did you see when you... The aftermath, what would you see? Well, I didn't go into the town. I didn't see what would, would happen, but I heard a lot of civilians got killed, and the Arvins took the brunt of it on that, on that fight. Okay, the Arvins? Uh, what is that? Uh, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. The Ar South, oh, okay. South Vietnamese soldiers. Okay. Uh, the next thing that we were going to do was go out and help relieve the Quezon combat base. We so this going, is your first time in Quezon, going into Quezon? The first time going into Quezon was uh, uh, March 10th of 1968. Well, we went in after the first air cav came up. Uh, with the you know came down Route Nine. Route Nine was what we call the Thin Green Line. It was the line okay. uh, highway going across North uh, South Vietnam, but uh, in the northern part of it, up by the DMZ. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had our uh, bases strung out along this line, and we called it the Thin Green Line that we defended against the North Vietnamese. We used it. And we had case on at the far western end. We had uh, we, we were building a new combat base called LZ Stud at the time. We changed it to Vandergrift. Uh, they had the, what you call the rock pile, Camp Carroll, they had Camp Contien, Camp Lowe, 
Then we had another place in Hua uh, Viet and Dong Ha, Wang Tree. Well, our job was now was to go out and get information on the enemies. We were going to do go in with a four-man team, spent four days. Four, we took uh, four cans of sea rations with us, one can a day. Took a travel light, and we're supposed to go in, check out, and find the North Vietnamese Army, and see what they were doing. Report back. Now, you're not totally... wearing your typical, like, I, I don't know if we captured this before, but I want to capture it now. So you're not wearing typical helmet, flat no, jacket. No, we, we went with, we, went, we traveled light, and we didn't want to make any noise. So we wore what we call a soft, soft cover, uh, just our uh, utility jungle, jungle fatigues. And, uh, you know, jungle boots, and we mm -hmm. carried our M16s and as uh, much ammunition as we pack in our pack. Right. Uh, grenades, we carried, I carried 10 grenades, I carried uh, smoke grenades, I tend to have uh, high explosive grenades, a couple uh, smoke grenades, we, we repeat a grenade, I carried a Claymore mine uh, on my stomach, uh, and I also had the radio. A quick question. If that Claymore mine gets shot, I mean, you get, get shot in the stomach, but if it gets shot, does that trip then, or is it only when some other... The, uh, you, you had to have a blasting cap in it. Usually okay, it so it's it really off, just... But if, it did, if, it, if, if I got shot in the stomach, <laughs> I'd probably, you know, in those days you died. You didn't really survive right. too much. So it's that. irrelevant if there's a Claymore <laughs> mine strapped to your stomach. But, you, you know... Yeah. Well, we had it, you know, I had it inside my shirt. I had, we had, it. Yeah. We had, we had, to, have had to carry stuff, room. right. We had, I carried water in my... Uh, Backpack. I mean, I carried water in my canteens. Uh, carried a lot of water. So we're getting to the Battle of Quezon, right? Mm -hmm. But before we get there, you're running patrols out of where? Dong Ha? Well, Dong Ha is where my base was. Okay. That's where we, we uh, prepared for our patrols, and that's where we uh, you know, first got into helicopters. When we went to Quezon, they wanted us to get on helicopters to Dong Ha, take them into Quezon. Mm-hmm. And then get back on the helicopters, a case on, and go out on the patrol. Okay. Make it that you know we we'd sit down and in case on, they'd leave us there maybe for a day or two, and then we'd get on helicopters, go out on our patrol. Uh, I went on the first keyhole operation that our company performed outside of the uh, outside of case on to check and see what was going on. What the movements were for the North Union. Yeah, we heard we on the first patrol we heard a lot of noise. We heard a lot of chopping of wood. We heard a lot of whistling and, you know, things going on that, uh, you know, human voices. Right. But we didn't see anybody. We didn't get a chance to see anybody. We worked around. We had a four grid square area that we were checking out. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were basically sent out there to see if it was possible for people to go out and come back. Huh. And we made it out and we made it back. Right. Then we started running more. But when you did this, did you lose anybody in your, I mean, you're talking about four-man team, so you... I mean, if you I lost didn't. somebody, it's like 25%. Every... Yeah, if we lost somebody, it's usually pretty bad for the team. No, I didn't. I okay. didn't lose anybody. For those keyhole of... operations? For the keyhole operations. Right. I okay. mean, our company lost people, but uh, right. we had we had, had some people lost at Friendly Fire also. Uh, the uh, Air Force bombed one of our keyhole operation teams, uh, four-man teams, out uh, outside of Quezon. Friendly Fire. Friendly Fire. Yeah. But and there's something i got to mention about Quezon and about the battle. It wasn't that the first air cav came up and relieved the base, or that the Marine Corps would uh, to break the siege, or that the Marine Corps fought them off or did anything. The weather changed. Okay. Cleared up. We couldn't use uh, cloud aircraft. Cover? Aircraft and the cloud cover was like 100 feet off the ground. It had the cloud cover, uh, so they couldn't use. Uh, you know, air, any air. So, so weather changed for the better. During the monsoon season, case had been socked in by the weather. Okay. And this is what enabled the North Vietnamese to, perform, to keep up their siege. Because we couldn't use our air support. They had B-52 raids, but they were just dropping bombs on the, on the jungle. It was like, you know, you, uh, to make a, effective air support was when you had a close-in air support with the infantry. Okay. Or with force of constant. Good or, for us, okay. American troops. But we could use our, our, our air support. Okay. But prior and to we this, could, we couldn't. Right. We couldn't run okay. the keyhole operations because we, we had to wait for the weather to clear. Okay. And that way we could get in. Sometimes we'd get in and the weather wasn't totally good. Uh, you know, we'd be socked in. We'd go on a four-man, uh, four-day patrol, end up being out there for nine, 10, 12 days. Mm -hmm. And we only had four cans of sea rations with us, so we starved the rest of it for maybe a week. <laughs> after. Would you eat bugs? <laughs> 
We, well, I didn't eat any bugs. We didn't do that. We, we basically you're humping. You're you want water. You need of water. Of course, yeah. Try I mean, to you can survive it. Try to make the sea rations last as long as you can. Right, you know I mean? right. But uh, uh, the main the main thing was getting water, and we had to get our water out of the rivers streams that they had there. And we had How'd to use hell's own, huh? How'd you filter it? How did you filter it? We didn't filter it. We just put hell's own tablets in it and uh, hope <laughs> for the best. Hope for the best. No yeah. parasites. Okay. Yeah. Let's get to the Battle of Quezon. All right. When does it become an actual all-out battle and not just some operation or keyhole operation? Are you holding Well, Quezon? it was a, huh? What, what? They're holding the Quezon. Who's holding Quezon? The 26 Marines. The 26 Infantry Marines. The 26 okay. Marines. And they had some Arvins and they had some... Uh, Arvins, which is the yeah. Army... The, Vietnam, Vietnam, Army of, uh, the South Vietnam, Vietnamese Army. Yeah. Gotcha. It was mostly Marine, United States Marines that were there. Okay. You know, holding the base. Uh, they, then they had the 9th Marines. And after the Keyhole operation started, when we started uh, finding out the location of the North Vietnamese, uh, the 9th Marines went out and started an offensive. Okay. And they got beat up pretty good. Most of the They say that in the case on the casualties, were about 500 Marines killed and uh, 25. Wound, 2,500 wounded. Uh, most of the casualties, most of the deaths were, and they didn't count as deaths at Quezon. They were out in the operation, the offensive going on uh, in between the uh, Laysia border and uh, Quezon by the 9th Marines. So now the battle is going on. Right. We were, There's uh, offensives going on. We were getting, uh, our, our recon, uh, Patrols were starting to run into. First of all, we started running into contact around the Laotian border, the Laotian, the Laotian, Laotian border. border. Uh, we got uh, then all of a sudden the contact started getting closer to uh, Quezon, and this isn't going into June. In June, the weather was going to change again because you had the La uh, you had the Laotian monsoons coming in. Okay. First of all, we had the Vietnamese monsoons, then the Laotian monsoons were going to come in, and uh, you know they're going to start at the end of, in middle of June. Mm -hmm. So we were running patrols to try to see if we could find a North Vietnamese Army. We knew they were moving in on Gaysan again. Okay. And uh, finally, we had six four-man teams go out in an area. We knew that they had to be there. We figured one of the teams was going to find them. This is an offensive right now. This is an, this is an offensive. Well, you're doing recon for a, an ultimate offensive? Because you really are recon. You're trying yeah. to find well, out. You're not really going to engage unless you have to. Well, we started out that we weren't engaging. We were just getting reconnaissance. But then after a while, we found out that they moved too fast, so we decided that we better start engaging. So we got artillery assigned. Who decides that? Huh? Who decides that? The platoon leader? Who decides to engage? Well, we just all got together and decided that this is stupid. Yeah, but is that, <laughs> is that protocol in the Marines to do that? Huh? Is that protocol for, for you guys to well, do that? Well, it's like coming up with a battle plan. You know, after the general's battle, battle plan falls apart, then all the guys get together and they... Well, same thing happened on D-Day in, uh, in northern France. Yeah. Yeah. So we, uh, we decided that we wanted artillery and we wanted uh, air, air support. and Because so, by the time you report back, it's too late. By the time they could get an infantry unit out there. Because your late. recon is yeah. probably, I don't want to say worthless, because they're moving too fast. Well, they, to... they didn't stay in one place too long, you know, to get... Uh, right. Get, uh, so you, you know you couldn't find out where they were going to be. So when we found them, we started now. We started calling artillery in on them. We started calling in airstrikes in on them, gunships, which mm -hmm. are uh, like Hueys with uh, with machine guns and rockets on them. Uh, a Cobra, which is a faster moving air helicopter, right? They fired a lot of rockets and they had uh, Gatling guns on it. Mm -hmm. Gatling guns, and they. Um, uh, we started. We caused a lot of damage to the North Vietnamese by doing this. Then we also had had our weapons. I mean, it came to the point where we had to do the fighting ourselves. We had to, you know, initiate. The, once the, uh, the, con uh, the contact initiated, then we called in the uh, artillery, or we called in the uh, the gunships or the air uh, phantoms, uh, with jets, uh, about two hundred fifty pound bombs or napalm around our position. Uh, we also had at night a thing called Spooky, which was a uh, uh, C-127, I believe, to carry, uh, if I, my memory is correct, carried miniguns. It had miniguns on it, and they could go right around. Uh, you put out a strobe light, we used to, to hook it to our antenna on our radio, our whip antenna. 
and uh, they put their wing on it, basically, the strobe light, and they just go right around firing their miniguns, and they take out a whole... Put your area. wing on it, mean just, just, side, just, just, just go circle right around the, the circle. strobe? Yeah. Oh, okay. And they just keep fire right down, and they knock out the uh, the enemy around you. It was a pretty awesome scene to see. If you're sitting down there, you watch it. It's like a hell of bullets coming out, and you can see all the tracers. You know, and it's just right around you, just dropping, firing these things. So this uh, is during the actual Battle of Quezon? During, yes. Okay. Yeah. Because what, from what history tells us, you know, this battle was lost. Is that true? No. But history does not tell us it's lost. It's, history tells you, that they say we lost the battle. That, 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 this, is the, this is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. It's, uh, tell, me what, tell me what your belief or what you know that happened. Well, what I know what happened, we drove the North Vietnamese back out again. We uh, caught them, uh, as I said, we had the four, uh, six four-man teams, and we caught the, the 324th, three clicks, or 3,000 meters outside of Quezon. Mm -hmm. uh, me, Babin, Wiley, Wiley and Falstrom uh, caught them. And we had put up a, you know, we got surrounded, and we had to put up a big fight. You're four we, against what? Oh, Buku, many, a couple thousand, probably, 4,000. So four against about 4,000. I mean, you know, they're spread how many out rounds, the How many right. rounds do you have to take out, you know, how, how do you deal with this? Well, I had 440 rounds and everybody was carrying about 440 rounds. We had uh, each 10 uh, grenades apiece. And what we did, we just put it on semi-automatic, tried to... Uh, One and they time. weren't coming at a human wave charge. They were, we were right in the middle of where their group was. You know, they were spread out. They yeah. weren't... Uh, Hold on, you gotta watch what your hands are doing because this thing's bouncing all over all the right. place. <laughs> okay, no, it's hard to explain. It, no, I, it, no, I understand. It's I not like it's not like you get you know like you see in the Korean War or something where they had the where they just waves wave. of people come at yeah. you. So, so was, really, what happened is they're coming up in, in bits and pieces. They're trying. They're moving. They're you know trying to get uh, get the uh, well organized. Uh, uh, I'll flank us. Is what they're well organized. Doing. Well organized. Yeah. Who they trained radios? North, who they, trained the North Vietnamese to do this? Well, the North Vietnamese had a lot of training themselves. They fought in the uh, Ho Chi Minh fought in the uh, Second World War against the Japanese, right. and the troops that he fought against were French. Right. When the right. French, when France surrendered, their troops were on the side of the Japanese. Uh, the uh, then they had the uh, you know the war when they fought against the French again when the French ended up taking it as a colony in the fifties. Right. Uh, you know, and that's while we're fighting in, in Korea. Right. And uh, again, they you know after they partitioned Vietnam, the North and East wanted to go and take South Vietnam and have a who partitioned Vietnam. North? Who partitioned Vietnam? Well, basically, the United States did it. It's like when the French were uh, driven out uh, of the Phan Phu, or they were captured in the Phan Phu. The uh, French army uh, left Vietnam. You know, then the South Vietnam became you know South Vietnam and North Vietnam was controlled by Ho Chi Minh. Right, his soldiers. But South Vietnam had an army too. They, you know, kept it. the United States uh, gave them support. So was Ho Chi Minh, in essence, or hit, or he fought on the side of the Allies during World and War II. In World War II. Okay, so that's the that that's the story of Vietnam. Is this is an extension of World War II? It's an extension of the end of yeah, extension of World War II. The Korean War was an extension of World War II. Vietnam was an extension of Viet World War II. Right. It was all, like I say, you know, we're having brush fire. Now, the new enemy became Russia. And after when, World War II. After World War II. And then when uh, China went communist. Soviet well, Union. When you say Russia, you mean Soviet Union, obviously. I mean the Soviet of Union. Of course, I'm sorry. We call it Russian. I, no, of course, I know. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, China. Red China. Communist China. Which we still got today, communist China. Of course. Uh, and what I what we what they wanted to do is what they did is they broke the alliance between the Chinese and the Russians, okay. which was done. We, but we were basically there because of the Straits of Malacca. Okay. Shipping yeah, lanes. Shipping lanes. Yeah, mm -hmm. because uh, if you listen to Eisenhower's talk, he said that uh, if we didn't hold on to the Straits of Malacca, keep that area you know free to shipping. We might even lose the Hawaiian Islands. Mm, the Philippines, right. Japan would fall, the Hawaiian Islands even, he said, you know, would fall. Because if you didn't, you, you, now you'd have to ship. Oh, I think they, that would increase the shipping lanes to 7,000 miles mm -hmm. if you didn't have the Straits of Malacca. Right. 
We also had Australia and New Zealand that were they're worried about. Now Indonesia was communist after when the Vietnam War started. Indonesia got rid of the communist regime. Mm -hmm. Regime. Um, Malaysia would had problems with the communists. They fought them off. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same thing with Thailand. Thailand, we we're afraid that they're going to take over Thailand. That was the reason why we went into Vietnam to protect Thailand. Initially. Initially. Okay. Well, we actually went into Laos. They, they, they were attacked from Laos. Laos. I mean, I know how you pronounce that, yeah. just to make sure people understand you're saying Laos. Yeah. Or Laos, Laos however you, yeah. Well, they, uh, I say it both ways. <laughs> right. Say Laos, some people say Laos. No, I know. I, just, that, you know, I, don't know any, I don't know the difference. I mean, I don't know. So I wanted to make sure so, that I was clear uh, on that. The, uh, the first raids were done by the communist guerrillas in Thailand. Mm -hmm. Once they started going into Thailand, we said we got to stop them, and we sent people to the house. So after Green Beret, so after World War II, the communists, the fact that Soviet Union beat Nazi Germany, they pretty much beat Nazi Germany on their front. On their front, yeah. Right. And we but beat we them did a lot with the D Day and all that. Of course, of course, because we the kept their we kept their attention split in multiple yeah. uh, uh, theaters, but. Um, Regardless, how who did what? The communists, they're feeling they're feeling like they're they're the top, the top dog, right? They're feeling like they are they're the ones that killed or found Hitler. They're the ones that killed Hitler. Basically, yeah. They were and so the they're ones. feeling they, like well, they're the, the boss. Allied troops, point. the Allied troops are told us to hold off and let the Soviet troops go into uh, Berlin, right? And. Uh, but if it wasn't for the, you know, it was a, it was a joint effort. The point is, though, that they believed that they were. It was a joint effort. But they, they believed, believed that, that they, they were the, the ones dogs. that the, the top dogs. They were the ones that defeated. Germany. So now they're trying to claim. They're trying to claim territory. But also, France wants their territory back. France wanted their colonies back. Yeah, that they lost in Indochina. The, Indochina. China. So this is a complex mess that you got into. It's, uh, well, you had a lot of people from the United States that were in the Central Intelligence. Uh, that wanted to give, not to give it back to the French, to let the, China, to let the uh, Vietnamese control Vietnam. Well, I don't and, see why uh, not. Cambodia that, and, yeah. and Laos. And let them control Thailand. themselves. Yeah. Right. Well, the British held on to, and they didn't lose it, but they held on to Malaysia. It was the British that had Malaysia and Singapore. Okay. But they lost Singapore to the Japanese. But, I mean, you know, they yeah. went back. And back. But the French, uh, the French army was protecting or fighting for the Japanese at the time. Right, Ho Chi Minh had to fight the French army. Right, so there was a lot of conflict with that, saying you know, like, uh, Ho Chi Minh always said, he said, "I I supported you, I helped you in the war, and the enemy I fought was French." This is the interesting part of Vietnam, the the Vietnam War, as well as Korea. You have the communists riding high off of their let's call it their win, right? against the fascists, the National Socialists of Germany, um, Hitler and the Nazis. And they believe that they won, and from what I understand. They believe that they're the reason why World War II uh, was a victory for the Allies. They want land. And, but of course, the uh, Western powers, they like to make sure that shipping lanes stay open and that we don't lose islands such as Hawaii, Philippines, and others, uh, Guam, you know. So there's a lot at play here. And so Vietnam is just an interesting place to have this small brush war, I guess, is what the way he referred to it, the way my dad referred to it. So there's a lot more going on than just we're going to Vietnam. You have the French that want their, their territories back. You have the communists that want to claim land. And then you have uh, other Western powers like the United States that want to keep open shipping lanes because it would be disastrous for our democracy. So here we are in Vietnam. But we're going to get into the Battle of Khe San now. So uh, here we go. What I'd like to do is actually get deeper into the Battle of Khe San and then the battle right outside Khe San that they don't really talk about. Is that fair to say that that's, that's how I would describe it? Well, they don't really talk. Yeah, they only talk about the battle inside Quezon. They only talk okay, about so there, too. Tell me about the Battle of Quezon. The Battle of Quezon do doesn't necessarily include your platoon, your fort, you and three Well, others. we were inside Quezon. Okay. 
And okay, someone's getting shelled, rocket uh, artillery, uh, rockets, mortars. It was a pretty messy place. So everything was underground. Uh, he had a perimeter set up, and they had a couple of times the enemy tried to get inside the perimeter and attack. They were driven off. It had, uh, 26 Marines were the Marines that were there. I don't know the name of the Arvin unit, but there was an Arvin unit there also, Rangers. Um, and that's the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. Right, right, right. Uh, so case, case on Combat Base was a pretty messy place. I mean, after all the uh, bombardments, they, take, they took uh, about 1,400 rounds in one day. Mm. It was completely... They were only resupplied by C-130s were coming in. They couldn't land. They'd come in and they'd drop the cargo out that had parachutes on it, yeah. and it'd pull it out of the back of the, of the C-130. And at some point, they were just flying over and dropping it and hoping that they got the stuff to land inside so the, com North Vietnamese, the combat base. The North Vietnamese are trying to, at this point, they're attacking Americans mm -hmm. in Quezon, in our Quezon. base. They also attacked the village of Quezon right. and wiped out the village of Quezon. We, uh, we got the survivors of that. We brought them down to uh, Quang Tri, to a place called Tin City, where we built tin, quonset, uh, tin huts for them with right. tin roofs, right. know, wooden right. huts with tin roofs. And it was called Tin City. And that's where we had to move the people from the Quezon village of Quezon. So the North Vietnamese did overrun the village of Quezon, but they never ran, overran the combat base. Okay, so now why did the Marines that were in Quezon leave? The Marines, what happened was after... Yeah, tell, me more about, tell me more about that battle, about the battle, because this is the battle at the, at the base, is that correct? Yeah. Well, that, when they talk about the Battle of Quezon, it's actually the base. The base is what they Our talk American about. base. There. Our American base. Okay, tell me a little right. about it. Uh, well, you got to remember that we had infantry units fighting before the Battle of Quezon. They took and held uh, 881. Hill 881. Hill 881, 861. Hill 881 north and south. So we won the hill battles, which kept the North Vietnamese from getting up on the hills. Mm -hmm. Now, they had their guns on a hill and... Laos, that wasn't part of the hill battles. And they were, buried, they were tunneled right into the side of the, of the Sheer Cliff. Okay. And they'd pull them out and they'd fire at Quezon for that. They also had attacked Long Ve, which was a, uh, a Green Beret uh, compound. And they overran it. The Green Berets were pulled out. They were taken out by helicopter. Hmm. And the uh, uh, mountain yards were the people, they just left them behind. Didn't pull them out. Uh, and they came in, they went into Long Bay with their tanks. Their Russian tanks that they went in with. And they, the North Vietnamese came in with Russian tanks. With Russian tanks. Right. Yeah. And their guns and 152s are Russian artillery pieces. Right. And they're very accurate. They're a lot more accurate than our artillery. And their tanks can go places our tanks couldn't go. It was amazing where they brought their tanks. Right. We didn't use tanks out in that area because it was just too rough terrain for a tank. They say every backyard is a good backyard for a tank. Not, that not for ours. <laughs> for the Russians, maybe, but not for ours. In those days, I mean, they built better tanks so after the, that. So the battle's going on, and North Vietnamese are trying to take hills around Quezon to fire into Quezon. To base. get the high ground. To get the high ground. To get the but the Marines ground. held the high ground. Which Marines? Do you know which ones? It, I mean, it... uh, 26 Marines. Okay. Part of it. And, uh, I'm sure there are nice, The 1-9, one, one uh, uh, some of the 4th Marines. Well, now, are you attached to any of these Marine divisions, or are you... Well, I'm attached to the 3rd Force, or the 3rd Marine Division. So the reconnaissance, the Eisenhower's of the 3rd Marine Division. Oh, okay. okay. Right? We worked, we had battalion recon, which was worked more as a, with battalions, different uh, infantry units. But uh, force recon was the uh, main reconnaissance. So you're going out, you're doing recon, you're, you're calling in airstrikes at this time. And th these were the, the key, did you call them keyhole? Um, keyhole operations. Okay, and, but now we're in the battle. We're in the battle of Quezon. They've already taken the town. North Vietnamese taken, have taken took the town. Took the village of Quezon. Took the village. Mm -hmm. And now they're attacking our base. Yes. Okay, and we're holding it. They're holding it. They held it. They held it. Yeah. So why did, did, did the North Vietnamese ever take our base eventually? Meaning occupy our base. Did we leave it? We left the base. Abrams, when he came in and took over for Westmoreland. Westmoreland, right. He decided, uh, when we found the North Vietnamese, the 324th was the 14th of June, was when we were fighting and when we got extracted. On the 14th of June, Abrams decided to close the base of Quezon. 
Okay. Because the Marine Corps did not want it. We didn't think it was necessary. Okay. Yeah, it was better. You know, we had uh, better options. We had Vandergrift they built. We had different. Uh, the what? LZ uh, Vandergrift. Vandergrift, Which okay. was LZ Stud originally, and they changed the name to Vandergrift. was a better uh, location for it. Okay. A combat base, you know, the supply or support that area, right? And plus, smaller bases they wanted smaller bases that you could move, move in and move out and do things, you know, you didn't get caught in a quagmire like you were in a caisson. So, when was the Battle of Caisson? What date? I think you said April. Uh, no, the Battle of Caisson lasted uh, from January 1968 until June, uh, July 1968. Okay, but you had one part was a siege, right, which ended in April. Well, they said it ended in April, and then you had another part, which was the offense, and that—that's what you that were part was, of. That's right, part of the offense to try to keep it. But the North Indians were still trying to come back in and trying to take Kazan. They wanted—they wanted to destroy to take the combat base and say they had a victory right. against the Americans in right. Vietnam. They never had a victory. They couldn't—they didn't win any of the battles, right? The major battles that they had, uh, and that's what made it so important for the patrol I was on when we were. Looking for the North and East Army. So, so basically, at, from April to June? April to Ju uh, July. April to July, you're now on the offense looking for the North, North Looking for East. the North and East. Okay. You know, at first, it started out that we're just trying to get their location, get to a complete reconnaissance patrols. That didn't last more than two patrols. And then we realized that we better start, if we got them, and the weather's good, and we could get our air support out there, right. we could call in artillery, we call in spooky at night, we got we, we do had all this stuff at our avail you know that was available to us. We could do the job of an infantry company, right? Because you don't have time to call in infantry because they're moving too fast. Yeah, you can't. The infantry wouldn't be able to get out there to help you in the time that you needed. You gotta use your support. And then the other thing was getting an extraction. You know, soften them up enough so a helicopter get in and take you out. And once you had the area located, they could take, send a B fifty two raid out there. Now they knew where they were. You know, if you get the beat, but they came from Guam, so that was also took a lot of time. Right. So you had you're better off using your uh, post and air support, your phantoms. So go out there. And, it's uh, you and three guys. Me and three other guys. Three other guys, and you're out on patrol. Yeah, and we defeated and the North Vietnamese Army. Well, you didn't. <laughs> they went. They stuck their tails between their legs and ran back to Laos. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> they met us. They thought there may be one or two of us, but they found out there were four. So it was oh, an ambush. We right, 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 right. <laughs> So, so now, what I'm curious to know, and I want other people to know, is what, when you were being extracted, tell me, that, tell me what time of day it was, how it went down, what, what was going on the day or the week or a few days of your extraction? All right, we went in on the, uh, the 13th of June. We were, we were briefed on the mission of 12th of June, went in on the 13th. When we got it, when we got... 1968. 1968. Okay. When we got inserted, the helicopters called us back and said, you're surrounded by North Vietnamese troops we're all over the place down there. So they inserted they said, you, and you're already surrounded. And we're already, Perfect. Well, we, <laughs> and they said that, you know, <laughs> they said, that, you know, the old Godspeed, you know, but we're not coming back to get you. <laughs> so good so the, Right. So we're not so saying we, that they're going to leave you behind, but this is your mission. Yeah. This so is your we mission. said, let's carry on the mission. Your mission. So yeah. I was a point on this patrol. I want some trigger time. Okay. <laughs> so I was a radio man up to this, and then, you know, Babbitt started carrying the radio, and I wanted some trigger time. So I, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I, I ran point. So I, he told me, he says, get us out of here. You know, the elephant grass was only about three feet high where we were, so we had to crawl on our bellies and get about a thousand meters and uh, get to taller elephant grass, where it was about 10 to 12 feet tall. We got into the elephant grass, and we moved on further, and we got into the woods, okay. into the, the thickets. The first night we went in, we uh, went around the area. We looked uh, you know, for people, and we got up on a hill, and we set up our. Uh, we had supper, and then we decided to move off to our harbor site, which was where we slept at night. We moved into a, about a hundred meters away from where we ate, where the North Indians probably saw us, and we figured we'd move in at at, uh, at dusk and move into our harbor site. We moved into the thickest thickets we could find. We just got in there, and we had a. Sheer cliff on the side of us, almost sheer. So nothing's there. coming from the side of you or whatever. Nothing because... was going to be able to get us from the side there. So we, we, you know, we slept that night. We had our, you know, watch going on. No one slept too much. It's, we it's just four busy. of you. Yeah. Okay. And we could hear them, you know, whistling and making noise. And what are they doing that walking. for? They're trying to find us. And that's how they kept. 
at night. That's how they kept communication with each other. They do whistles. They do, you know. And so, how many? How many are out there? Do you do, do you think? Well, at this at this time here, I, I there were small like patrols that were going around looking for us. But similar to what you, they had huh? similar to you, similar to what you had. Before. Yeah. Well, they're more. You know, they they're probably squads. You know, looking okay. for us. Uh, you know, then when it cleared up and the sun came up in the morning, we got up and we found a, a trail about four meters away from our position. Wow. And, uh, yeah, we heard them walking and doing this. I didn't know they were that close, but they're, they're pretty darn close. So you find this path, this trail. Well, that was four meters away from our position where we were sleeping. Right. Well, we moved out and we moved down the hill, down toward there was a river going through. And we moved down the hill to see what we could see down there because we thought that they were in the valley more than mm-hmm. being on the hilltop or on the side of the hill. So we went down looking for them. And we got to one spot where we were looking across the river, and we could see some guys with binoculars looking at us. <laughs> so you're looking at them, and they're we're looking, looking at, at you. Uh, yeah. And then the rear security opened fire. What's rear security? Rear security is the last guy in the patrol. He opened fire because you know, they were behind us. Okay, so they're behind you and in front of you, and, yeah. but not in the side of you. Well, they weren't. They were, like, behind us on the uh, across the river if we were facing toward Quezon they'd be on our left hand side to the south of us okay and we had uh Babin told me to head up the hill he said uh, he was a team leader I was the point he said get up the hill find a fighting position so now hold so, on you're not actually in Quezon at this point no where are you at this point we're three meters outside of Quezon I mean three thousand meters I was gonna say three so, three thousand meters outside of Quezon at this Okay. We, I get to the top of the hill and I set up I found a field of fire beautiful about 200 meters I had a Clear fire. I, I could shoot, you know. Have you opened fire yet? I hadn't opened fire yet. Your rear so did. My rear security opened fire, or our rear security opened fire. Okay. And they, they took out a couple of North Vietnamese troops that were behind us. And we got, I got up to the top of the hill. I set up my position. The rest of the team came in. I had to clear fire. Now I started shooting. Because now I could see them moving down around, trying to How far? around on us and try to get up to the hill that was to our uh, west. How far away were they? Uh, right then, at that point, they were close to 2,000 meters, 200 meters away. 200 meters. 200, uh, yeah, 200 meters. Then, you know, we just kept firing. We do, we, we, uh, uh, but you only have 440 rounds each. Yeah. But we, I, I was on semi-automatic. I didn't want to get on an automatic. So you, when you're shooting, it's one. Two, I'm aiming to shoot and two, what I could see. You know, right. when I see somebody move, I bam. I, you know, yeah. I was knocking people down for what I was doing. And so was everybody else was doing about the same thing. And we're throwing grenades. What do you think that the North Vietnamese... How many did they think they were fighting? How many did the North Vietnamese think they were fighting? Four? Or did they think that they were fighting a squad? I think they might have thought they were fighting a little more than four people at this point, because we were knocking them down pretty good. And that's part of what our training does. That's yeah. part of what the Marines... And we're tra- yeah. and uh, Babin did not want to call in support because he was wanting to get an extraction. And if we had artillery going off, the helicopters wouldn't. Okay. So he was trying to get an immediate extraction out of there, giving in gunships and, you know, he was gunships and knock down the fire and get the helicopter in. Meanwhile, <clears throat> like I say, they're, they're moving in the, the south, but they're moving toward the westerly direction. They weren't coming straight up the hill. They're moving across. And what they did is they circled around us and came up on the hill behind us. Because okay. uh, you've west, already moved away from western, this cliff that you're talking about. Huh? You've already moved away from this cliff that you were talking about. You're completely we, away. That was your well, sleeping position. We got, I, got, I got back up there. Okay. When, uh, you know, when we had the cliff behind us. Yeah. And where our plan was that if they didn't come and get us, we'll wait till dark and we'll jump off the side. Why would we'll you do that? Well, we'll oh, slide down. Okay. Yeah. okay. Not, not, like, <laughs> not like on uh, the, the lone survivor there. Right. right. He goes down the hill and he's tumbling down. Right. No, you we would... know how to go down. You, you, you sit down and you go down the hill. It's like, it wasn't a clear drop off. It was like a pretty. You had some slope. And we knew to we'd it. make a. We knew we'd be able to slide down. Gotcha. Okay. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because that's it. Sounded like the lone survivor. Where he was just like trying. He was the last one left, trying to get away from the Taliban. Yeah, but he didn't go down the hill, right? No, he just tumbled. <laughs> no, that's not the way. I think that's it. Hollywood that did that. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> well, uh, so yeah, we. Uh, I I threw ten grenades. I had. Uh, yeah, you talk about smoke grenades, etc. So you had you so, had some something to. And everybody else had the same thing. They were you know so. Um, now the finally. They got a helicopter crew that was willing to come out and get us. Okay, but you're still battling, and you're we're running still, out of ammo. And yeah, we're running out of ammo. But they're probably running out of ammo, too. The North Vietnamese, they carry three magazines of ammunition with them. Is what they had. That's what the individual soldier carried. So three magazines is what? How, what's in the well, magazine? Well, there were banana clips of 30 rounds. Okay. 
So just three, 90? Huh? They only had 90 rounds? That's all about that carry. That was one of our advantages. That's something that made it a little easier for us. I mean, you know, helped us out a little bit. They, they had to conserve their ammo, too. Of course. Because you know, they still had to go and attack case on. But, uh, right, and they didn't get the case on yet because they have to get through, the, through you. Right, we, st- we, we got in their way. And so the helicopter said they, they, said they were coming. And they, you know, they had some gunships with them. And they, uh, you know, uh, called us up and said, do I throw out a red smoke? So we threw out a red, a red smoke. Or, uh, and he said, I see four red smoke shots. Would, why, would North Vietnam BD soldiers also throw red? They're like just to, a, okay. Trying to lure the helicopters into their position. Oh, uh, man. Okay. Then he said, all right, throw out a green smoke. We threw out a green smoke. He says, I see four green smokes out there. Because <laughs> they're listening. <laughs> yeah, they're listening. They're picking they're listening. up. They're, they're up on our radio, up on our frequency, and they're listening. To so then he said, all right, I want two guys to go out with air panels and direct me in. Okay, so that's just sort of a, a, uh, a red air panel. You put it, you know, oh, open okay. it up. I used to carry that and with my Claymore mine. Yeah. And I, I went out. I grabbed. That was the point. I was out of ammunition, so I said, "There's no point in me sitting here." Right. I'll put the air. I'll hold the air panel. And then Falstrom, Steve Falstrom, grabbed another air panel, and he came out alongside me. When I got out there, the helicopter came down, it landed on the hill uh, to our west, and then all of a sudden picked up and came shooting in toward us. You know, and not shooting at us, but you know, came right. directly in toward our position. When the helicopter did this, uh, an uh, automatic position opened up on me. An automatic position, meaning North Vietnamese was an automatic... Uh, automatic, yeah. Whatever. And, and, you machine know, gun of some machine sort. Machine gun, yeah. yeah. And uh, he had tracer rounds in it, and I could see the tracer rounds. I fell back. And what, you were just laying on the ground? Yeah, I was laying on the ground, with my back, you know, back on the ground, and looking up at the sky, and I could see the rounds. Are you in across. a hole? No, I was on flat ground. There's no crater, nothing, just no, no, flat I, ground. We, when we, my defensive position was a bomb crater. That's what I picked. Okay. When I ran up, and that's where we fought them from. But when I had to bring in the helicopter, I had to get up and go on the flat ground. So they could see your air panel. So they could see my air panel and right, direct them in. Right. And uh, the gunner on the helicopter, the, uh, one of the 50 caliber gunners, he said he saw it about 20, meter, 20 feet away from me, and away from the helicopter, because the helicopter came in and landed. And they had me pinned down. He said that uh, they weren't firing at his helicopter. They are firing at their team, our team. So the, you're seeing tracer runs fly over your head. Uh, well, they're across my body. They were flying over my head. They're flying from my toes to, you know. And you didn't get hit. No, I didn't get hit. I, you know, like Pam was saying it. I said, I was afraid they're going to shoot my toes off. He goes, yeah. <laughs> well, he's just sticking up. <laughs> probably something else. <laughs> oh, yes. And he said, you're probably going to be afraid to shoot something else off. He goes, oh. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but. <laughs> wow. Uh, so, the, you know, the gunner. Uh, Law that's going on. He started firing. He shot the guy. The gunner so, shooting the person shooting you. Yeah, or shooting at you. Right, shooting at me. The rest of the team got up and they ran into the back of the helicopter. But you're still laying down. I was, I was the left, and you know, as soon as I the fire and stopped, which he was dead, I got up and I started running. I ran into the helicopter. He said, and the gunner said, uh, the last guy that came in the helicopter just flew in. He goes, he, said, he, was, he was airborne. He you had no, flew. you had no ammo. You had no grenades. I had no you grenades. just had an air panel. I just had and a claymore mine that you did. I had a rifle I could use as a club <laughs> and a K bar. Jeez, <laughs> but, hand in uh, hand. But you know, I felt luckily I got into the helicopter because the helicopter pilot said he wasn't going to stay there that long. All right, but, you I mean, know. you know. But, you know, Take out a whole helicopter. I, they thought I was dead anyway because, you know. You're laying there. I mean, they didn't think <laughs> I dodged a bullet. You know? <laughs> <laughs> didn't shoot but, off your toes uh, or anything else. Wow. Huh? Didn't shoot off your toes or anything else. Yeah. So that's good. So, you know, we got on and we, when we got up, we looked out and the whole hill was opening up like the 4th of July. There was just fire coming at the helicopter. How many were out there? Boku. No, I know that means a lot, but I mean, how, what what do you think? Thousands? Well, thousands, yeah. They, they, the helicopter uh, gunship said they took fire from a thousand positions. Right. Yeah. You know, so I mean, just, yeah, just as a, a good round number. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was almost a thousand. I mean, it was a <laughs> lot. It was at least uh, better than a thousand. You know, like the only the only way you can figure that is just buku. Right. You just look at it. The whole it was all around us. It was all around us, the whole thing. The whole, you know, we took off. It was just all that for four guys. Well, they had a helicopter too, and a helicopter. They're trying to get the helicopter. They're trying to get the crew of the helicopter. And uh, you know, uh, the, the gunner said, "He said, I don't know. He said, you guys must have pissed in their 
fish heads and rice or something. What the hell did you do? <laughs> they found you. You were in their way for them to get the case on. So then he said, they, you know, they were shooting at you. They were trying to kill you guys. They were mad at you, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. Well, all night you've been, or all morning you've been picking them off, right? Yeah, well, the whole afternoon. You know, I, I think we started about 12 o'clock and the, the helicopter didn't get in. Whoa. No, we started about three o'clock. The helicopter got in at almost seven. Were you able to? So at that point, once the extraction occurs, were you able to call anything in, or at that point, it's just let's just get out? Well, there was nothing we could do now because we're on the helicopter and the gunships are working. You had gunships working the area every so, time. So they, they're just they, going they, around, they're just going around shooting at every every time they see some opening, opening fire. They are just gun, you know, they just were working the hills over. You know, I think there were four gunships that were out there. That, uh, they brought in help. Uh, so at that point, that that's what date is this now? This is in sixty eight. This is 1960, June fourteenth, nineteen sixty. So June fourteenth. This is the same day Abrams decided that he was going to blow the base. Okay. You know, they didn't believe us. We were telling them that the North Vietnamese were moving in. They didn't believe us. That's why we went out to get them. Okay. You know, who else do we have but ourselves? You know, it's right. They, you know, so Abrams says we're going to close the that, base, and it was less about we're going to get attacked and more about. It's an irrelevant base. Yeah, irrelevant base is what it was. But it became a big battle. Well, it was a big battle. In, in, in April. You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, up until April. Yeah. Uh, well, after April, there were a lot of uh, offensive operations going on outside of the base. Mm -hmm. uh, Bravo Company of 1-9 they all been getting wiped out for some reason. I don't Jeez. know if they went back and got more men and they went out and they got into it again. It was... Yeah, I was hearing about that. They were digging up graves out there. We're digging up graves in North Vietnamese, massive graves. Um, wow. And th then, then the tigers came back. You mean legitimate tigers? Tigers. After they closed the base. Uh, and I could say, did they ever take over the base? Well, they had a couple of guys come on the base and put up a North Vietnamese flag. Yeah. And uh, we kept a radio relay station, relay hickory is what it was called. We call it 950. Hill 950. Hill 950. Mm -hmm. And uh, we relay up on Hill 950. And this was just outside of the case on combat base. We needed that. So mm -hmm. we didn't close the, the relay station because we needed to run patrols in sure. that area. We're sure. still working that area and they still had things going on. Uh, uh, I guess at night, a couple of North Vietnamese soldiers snuck into the base and put up a North Vietnamese. And Are you saying that for a fact border, or did they really just that, do Yeah. It, it, and the... Uh, the mortar position up on Hill 950 knocked the flag out. Oh, <laughs> they used it for target practice. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I, then I got sent in September. I was a radio, uh, as a radio man. So, so I you're still there. So now it's a. So you're. So you're. You did. You saw more action after this battle. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it was quite a bit more action. But I went up to Hill 950 radio relay station, and you know, and, and I was the highest ranking guy on the hill. So I'm trying to get. So this is September after. The July, uh, the June 14 um, battle. Yeah. Okay. By this time, I was a corporal, so I was in charge. Yeah, of not Lance Corporal, but a corporal. Corporal, okay. yeah. Uh, and I didn't see any North Vietnamese case on at all. Hmm. It was like they just completely moved out of the area. They weren't, weren't around. Even, you know, you look down right at the base, right at the airstrip, and you could see the whole thing. And there, was no, there were no North Vietnamese. They didn't take over the base. So for propaganda, though, they used it as they took over somehow. Well, who, who said that we lost this battle? We took the base back. With the Marine Corps band went out there and took the base back. The band? <laughs> On the Marine Corps birthday, June 10th, 1968. November 10th. I mean, November 10th, 1968. The Marine, right. Corps, Marine Corps band flew. And, you know, all of a sudden, we see all these helicopters coming out. All these things. And, you know, All these people said, what are they going to do? They must be getting ready to open up the base again. What do they want that for? I thought they were done with it, but no. Guys with these musical instruments came out. They got on the airstrip. And they, you know, Is there film of this? Can I find this on the internet? Somewhere? I don't think anybody took a film of it. I, uh, got to be something on the internet about it. Well, I'm but, sure the military has it. But uh, you know, there was like rumors of it. A lot of people had rumors. No one had actually seen it. And uh, you know, like in, in uh, Third Force, we have our Third Force of Council's Company reunions and all that. Yeah. And no one ever did. They said, "Did the Marine Corps band go out and play a case?" Somebody was telling us that. The Marine Corps band went out and played at Case. I said, yeah, I was up on 950, November 10th, 1968, Jeez. they came out. They're playing all suits of stuff, music. Da, 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 da. You know, all that was going on. <laughs> well, it, 
with the Marine Corps birthday. So, and watch <laughs> outbreak. <laughs> So, so I know. So, what do you think? They took North Vietnamese took over the base. No, no. the Marine Corps band could take it back. I mean, you know, right, 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 right. So, you know, a lot of times, though, a lot. Try to be serious here, you know. <laughs> it's not. You can't. You no, can't. I that know. That was something. I know. I know. I know. Everybody said, "Oh, they lost case on. Oh my God, this and that." It was nothing because that, now we had fire support bases around that area. Right, because that was better, more defensible, and they could, you know, if they had to evacuate, they could evacuate them. They keep fighting them in the hinterlands, so they keep them away from the town, in the villages, the, you know, of the, yeah. the east on the east coast. So we wanted to keep them out west by the border of Laos, you know, right, keep, right. you know, and keep them from getting in, you know, off the Ho Chi Minh Trail that went down just across the border in that area, and uh, that's what we did. Is we, you know, that's what they, you know changed our tactics. So you spent three months at Hill Nine Fifty. And you spend some more time, you team leader, and a few other operations. And then we let's did, come. We did a lot of DMZ patrolling. Okay. Four main teams going up there, checking out the DMZ. Uh, if we found them, we called in airstrikes against them. Right, right. Uh, during the bombing halt, so the infantry wasn't going to go up. Okay. <clears throat> we handled that ourselves. We also did bomb damage assessments, B 52 bomb damage assessments. And. Uh, I did 10 bomb damage assessments, and nine of them I didn't find it. Hmm. And they kept telling me, oh, there got to be a thousand dead out there, each and every one, a thousand. Every time. <laughs> so every time you go yeah. out, it's just a, it's a different, it's somewhat of a different story than what you expect. Yeah. It's like, you know, then on the, on the uh, 10th one, we went out and we found them out there. Mm. They were all alive. Oh. So now we're stuck in the middle of uh, this fiasco where we got all these people around us that aren't too happy with us. <laughs> they just got bombed, you know. I mean, right, they, they right, were right, they right. were pretty well shook, shook it up. They could so you it. had to do that sometimes, where you'd actually call in pretty close or on your position well, and try to I get the hell in, out of there. Uh, yeah, I called in uh, close air fire a couple of times. I got hit and had a piece of shrapnel for one uh, two hundred fifty pound bombs I was calling in. Yeah, and it just knocked me out for a little while, but it didn't uh, really didn't do much. I don't know how I lucked out on that, but. Uh, Mm. You know, danger close. It was out about it was out about uh, 100 meters, you know, between 150, 100 meters and 50 meters. The napalm, we could feel the heat from it. And of course, it, you know, yeah. I, I, I had an extension. I went home on leave. I came back. I spent uh, just about my whole second uh, my leave, uh, extension, but they started pulling out of Northern I Corps. What's I Corps? That's the uh, the area between the DMZ and Two Corps. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I mean, it was the northern part of uh, uh, Vietnam, South right, Vietnam, right. And, uh, the DMD, uh, and the Quang Tree Province. Uh, they were pulling out, and this was right after that, uh, I said we called it, you know, we called yeah. them. Uh, the, 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 them that were still, the bomb assessment, they're all alive. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, well, I had an I had a R and R in Australia. I went on that. I came back. I ran a couple more patrols, and then the we started running larger patrols because it pulled the infantry out, and mm -hmm. we were the only thing that you were. So, the, the, you were the force. The, the South Vietnamese Army was supposed to come and take over our areas that we were, you know, patrolling and you know uh, doing, and they didn't show up. So we were, did the best we could. Right. For the remainder of the time, then. Uh, my extension was just about up, and they wanted to pull some troops out. Uh, they, they wanted anybody who has an extension get them out of here. Mm -hmm. And I got sent out, and I came home on the Iwo Jima uh, air, helicopter landing pad. It was a troop carrier. Yeah, yeah, okay. Twenty-seven days at sea, <laughs> coming across the Pacific. <laughs> and you're back in California. And, we, and they brought me back to California. So okay, so this experience was, uh, I mean, something. Not many people even even can fathom. They have no idea what what that was like. They have no idea what emotions are running through you, what adrenaline's running through you, and now you have to come back to civilian life. And and, and did you did that affect you in any way, or, or did it, or, or are you just thinking, well, that's just part of the job? I mean, how, how, tell me a little bit about that. We don't have to go into too much detail, but I'd like to know a little bit about your you come back and what. Well, you just came were back, ridiculous battles, and now you come back and. Well, when I came back, I would say 
people don't realize that, uh, you know, you always think that, uh, you know, there were protests against us and all this. There were, there were, there were protesters. Most of the people were just curious. Yeah. You know, wanted to know something about it and what was going on and, you know, yeah. why'd you go? You know, the same questions. Um, kind of the questions like I asked you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got to remember, I joined the Marine Corps in 1966 and now we're talking about 1970. Right. And so in that four years, a lot of things changed. A lot of things happened. Not only, and, yeah, I mean, not only in you, but also in, in the country. Yeah, well, the Marine Corps is getting ready to pull out of Vietnam, and they're going in to get, you know, uh, give it, turn it over to the South Vietnamese more, and uh, Kissinger was talking, they had this peace table going on where he didn't know what, whether they have it round, whether they have it oblong, whether they have it in a nest position, you know, all these different right, things right, about right. they should worry about. Right. Instead of just saying, no, come on, we're going to sit down at a damn table, let's damn talk. I understand. You know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> let's trade this thing out right now. How do you want it? <laughs> want to do it the hard way or the easy way? So, hard way is if we blow you out of the sky. <laughs> so, okay, so so you're back. Yeah. And what do you have to do at this point? Well, how, do you, how, do you, how do you get out? How do you leave? What's, because you did I was say- I stationed at 29 pounds in California. There's a okay. radio operator and I was with a radio a communications company. Uh, you know, I didn't like that. So, kind of hard being out in the desert, doing nothing, just playing the games after being through I was through. So I said, sure. well, I'll go on. Project transition. Okay. So I got myself a job in an auto body shop up in Chino, California. Okay. <laughs> I served out the rest of my time in the Marine Corps doing auto body work. <laughs> okay. Well, that's one way to do and it. And they come out and check on me every once in a while to make sure I was still there. And, you know, right. They'd send me my check every once in a while if they felt like it. <laughs> my said she came out to see me because we were engaged. And yeah. We got married yeah. Up in California. Uh, he says, I weighed like 147 pounds. They weren't just paying me. Oh, jeez. You know, need to eat. eat. <laughs> you need to eat, man. <laughs> wow. But then finally, the other Marine, uh, they came over and checked on me. And I said, you know, man, I need a paycheck here. <laughs> you know? And he, you know, the other man got right on it and got me a paycheck. All right. <laughs> so anyway. at, at the end of all of this, the end of all of this, I mean, it, it's, it's, the, it's the biggest part of your life, I would say biggest uh most impactful experience of your life yeah what do you think now you're what you are let's see 48 you're born in 48 so you're 72 to turning 73 soon mm -hmm. what do you think looking back at all this no uh, it's like, like i say it was something people don't realize what was going on i think the vietnam war was like took the pressure off of a, a powder keg or, or out of a, a you know, I mean, things were at a, at a point it, uh, that it looked like we were going to go to war with uh, the Soviet Union. Mm. And that would have been disastrous. Of course. And this, this really is like, you know, relieving the pressure of the situation. Brought people back to their senses, back to, you know, yeah. not thinking, oh, we'll get those Ruskies, you know, we'll, you know. Right. Uh, you know, we'll just drop more bombs on them and nuclear weapons. You can't, you know. Right. <laughs> you know, we didn't. We didn't want to have a, war, a world left. If you got to remember, we had, uh, right. we had uh, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Right. You know, we had the Bay of Pigs invasion, then the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, you know, everybody was upset that the Russians had gotten into Cuba and got mm. to turn that communist with Castro. Right. Well, that was America's uh, playground for a while, yeah. Cuba, and then um, became communist. And, you know, things were pretty intense. It was pretty, you know, you needed something. You had the Korean War, uh, where, the, you know, we fought the Chinese, uh, North Vietnamese, and then the Chinese came across and we were defeating the North Vietnamese. I mean, not North Vietnamese, the uh, North Koreans. Right, right. Back on line here. Uh, lost a lot of men in that. And then, we, then they started in uh, about 1958 in Indochina. Uh, send troops to Laos, and uh, you know, we had people in uh, Thailand. And then uh, Eisenhower decided, he told Kennedy that you're better off not fighting in Laos, move the war. Laos was landlocked, but you get there through Thailand. Mm -hmm. He said, move the war to Vietnam. Eisenhower <laughs> told Kennedy that. Kennedy, move the war to That's Vietnam. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that worked out well. So they did. They moved the war to Vietnam, is what they did, because mm -hmm. you know, they were fighting. The North Vietnamese uh, uh, had. Uh, Insurgents in South Vietnam, uh, the Viet Cong, and most of them were being led by North Vietnamese soldiers. People don't realize that it wasn't an uprising from Vietnam; it was an uprising 
brought to South Vietnam by the North Vietnamese. Right. And they got wiped out. I mean, the North Vietnamese used them for cannon fodder. They just got wiped out in the end of 68. Now, when I was over here, I never fought a Viet Cong. I fought all North Vietnamese regulars. The North Vietnamese Army came down right. and started right. trying to take, you know, until 1973, Kissinger got his Nobel Peace Prize for getting peace in the Middle East and Vietnam. <laughs> We can go into that in another <laughs> one. I know you have Kissinger stories. We'll just let that one go. North Vietnamese ended the war in 1975 when they took over South Vietnam. Right. Well, listen. Let's well, we let's. Uh, this was a long. This was a long interview. So let's let. Why don't we? Uh, why don't we wrap it up with a little? Uh, I don't know. Good. I don't know. You have a good story for me. You have any, no. You have no. <laughs> All bad. <laughs> All right, well, war. what do you mean, good story? All right, well, that's why I and Margaret uh, Denang. What? The, the Christmas party. The USO Bob or whatever. Bob, Bob Oak, USO. There, there it is. <laughs> and Margaret and Bob Oak. And Margaret. Listen, oh. um, Dad, thank you very much for doing this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I appreciate it. You've told me these stories throughout my youth here and there, but I never really got a full picture of it. So I really appreciate you putting it together. And, uh, you know, thank you. Mm-hmm. That's it, huh? That's all. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank I you. I mean, what are you going to do? I'm not going to go back there again. And I hope uh, you don't no. either. You know? <laughs> I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> All right, man. <laughs> Later, guys. Hey, everybody. There it is. I hope you enjoyed this interview. It was interesting to hear my father discuss his time in Vietnam in a little more detail than what I remember. Um, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. And definitely for those uh, in the United States, I hope you have a beautiful Independence Day. Happy 4th of July. See you soon. Bye.